Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. What were the strengths and weaknesses of the Mirage and how did it handle? Well, I mean, the Mirage 2000, the, the biggest strength to me is it's, it's, it's totally indigenous to Dasso. So Dasso make the Mirage 2000 and nobody else apart from Martin Baker have anything to do with it. So they, inside the, you know, the hexagon of France, everything to do with that airplane is built in France. So that's a, a huge strength. In terms of... Um, I mean, there's so many things about the Mirage 2000 which I think are great. In that, when you when you compare a Mirage 2000 to the Mirage 3, the Mirage 3 looks on paper and on plan form. If you draw a Mirage 3 and you draw a Mirage 2000, they're almost identical. Yeah. Yet they're chalk and cheese. You know, the flying by wire and the the way the wing um, leading edge flaps come down on the Mirage 2000, the way the the you haven't got a tailplane for a start. You've just got the aileron, so they'll give you pitch and roll at the same time. Very, very clever. And the actual fly-by-wire system is incredibly, and I hate this modern word robust, but that is the best word for it because it never breaks. It always works. And I know that all the American pilots who flew it uh, on exchange, the one thing they wanted to know in detail for various reasons was how the fly-by-wire worked because it was... It, it was much better than the F-16. <clears throat> I can only say that having flown the F-16 and the F-18, it was a country mile better than the F-16. Wow. In terms of the feedback that it gave you as a pilot, so I liken it to a, a Lightning, which um, to me, and I, and I put this down to Roland Beaumont, the Lightning had the best... Um, feedback between the control column and thrust levers to a pilot that I've ever ever experienced in terms of you knew exactly what the aeroplane was doing without looking in the cockpit. So, and I'm probably, you know, with the sounds of time, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but <clears throat> you could tell from the noise, the ambient noise in the aircraft, what the thrust level was in the Lightning, mm -hmm. and you could tell what the stick loading was what speed you were and what G-loading you had. So you yeah. didn't really have to look in the cockpit. So even though there was no head-up display in the Lightning, you didn't have to look inside because you could just feel that stick force and know where your hand was on the throttle mm -hmm. to how the aircraft was performing in terms of your energy management. And the Mirage 2000, as an analogy, was, I would say, the electric version of the English electric Lightning it was like a lightning with fly-by-wire. Right. So it gave you fantastic, or it gives you, if you still fly the Mirage 2000 and you're watching this, it gives you the ultimate you know, pilot-machine interface where you can feel that you're really flying an aeroplane and whatever you're doing is connected and you're, you've become you know, the soul. Or you know, when they say that the engine's the heart of the aeroplane, you, know, you are definitely the soul of the Mirage 2000 when you're flying it you can make it sing and dance. And if you've watched Mirage 2000 uh, doing an air display, you know, it can do crazy flying. And, and, and the guy who's flying it really is, he's become part of the aircraft. Now, I haven't flown the Rafale <clears throat> and I haven't flown the Typhoon, but pilots that I've spoken to, they never have, they never seem to have um, the same passion for those fifth generation fighters as right. the fourth generation. So, you know, you've interviewed loads of guys and people you know that I don't know or people that have flown fifth generation aircraft, but I, you very seldom hear people extolling the virtues of the, even the Typhoon or the Rafa saying, "Wow, it's the most amazing, the fantastic, it handles so well." It's, they do, but they don't love it like a woman with the Mirage 2000. Yeah. So they're not, you know, you don't fall in love with a, a Rafa or a Typhoon, I don't think. But whereas the Mirage 2000, you almost do. You you know, you love that aeroplane and 
there was one of the pilots <clears throat> on our squadron called Gratter, and he became the Mirage 2000 display pilot, and one of the other guys did as well. But, you know, I love aeroplanes, but they were in love with the Mirage 2000. They were so passionate about that aircraft. They wanted to know everything about it, and they could make it sing and dance. You know, they could, as I said, you know, we had a head-up display, but they could make it do anything they wanted to without looking in the cockpit and just by feeling what they were doing. And I think, I, I might be you know, a little bit romantic, but I think the Mirage 2000 is probably the last aircraft where that man-machine interface really yeah. worked. Now, and you know, I, I you know, the aircraft I've flown since then were the A340 and the Boeing 787. There's, they're, they're just soulless. You know, they're just mechanical machines with no um, no feedback. And when you look at um, the the resurgence of people playing vinyl records, I was at a, a market in London a few years ago, and a guy was showing me this record turntable, and he was talking about mechanical feedback. And it's something to do with records. And I thought that is a very good phrase for the Mirage 2000 yeah. Lightning era. You know, mechanical feedback. So you're not just flying in a, in a computerized aircraft. You're actually flying in something that has a soul with it as well, and you're interacting with it. And that, to me, was what the Mirage 2000 was all about. It was a really, really well-harmonized aircraft and, and something that Dasso had produced that couldn't, couldn't be bettered, in my, in my opinion. Absolutely, and of course, she's an absolute beauty. Uh, but uh, one thing, obviously, our viewers love to hear about is DACT. So, how did the Mirage two thousand fare against the, you know, the F sixteens, F fifteens, etc.? Well, um, DACT in the Mirage two thousand is is almost like a two uh, two story event. When you talk about DACT, you talk about one circle fights and two circle fights. The Mirage 2000 is a two-story combat aircraft because if you do combat ACT, Mirage versus Mirage, yeah. you fight the airplane in a different way. If you fight it DACT versus F-16, F-18, Rafale, whatever, you have to adapt the aircraft to fight what the threat is. The Mirage 2000, and it took me a long while to understand it, the pilots on the squadron when I joined, who were very experienced, they were exceptionally good at combat. And the French Air Force are very, very good combat pilots. You know, they will go off and do whatever mission they do, and if there's five minutes at the end of the sortie, they will do a quick one v one split, right. pure you know, combat. Whereas the RAF, when I flew in the RAF, we never did that. You know, we would do intercept sorties, and then we would do some combat. Mm -hmm. A different sortie, but we would never mix the two very seldomly. It was, you know, it had to be very specifically. The Mirage 2000 is, um, is, is quite an interesting aircraft to do combat in because with a Delta Wing, you have a fantastic turn rate, but you also have massive induced drag in terms of mm. you can pull 9G at 450 knots, but you know, you'll end up at 200 knots. So when you actually come to a merge, and whatever you're fighting, there's actually no point in coming past at 600 knots because all you're going to do is just bleed it to 200 knots. So yeah. unless you're going to go into a vertical maneuver and convert that into height, then th there is no point. So you have to really understand <clears throat> the the dynamics of a delta wing and how once you've lost that energy, if you get below the drag curve on it and you get below whatever the speed was, and I can't remember what it was, but you can't just... Um, if you come into the merge and you do 40 knots and need this massive back turn to try and get a shot away, if you don't get your shot, you can't just leave it in full reheat and accelerate. It won't accelerate yeah. because there's so much drag on them. So you have to either put the nose down or you have to unload it and really push to unload it, to unload the wing, to accelerate yeah. back to 40 knots again. And some of the pilots in the squad, they were incredibly gifted at combat. And as I got more proficient, you could do combat 1v1 against Mirage, and it was it was eye-watering it, it, to see how close you could get. And that old phrase of you know, a knife fight in a telephone box, yeah. never truer than it was in the Mirage 2000. And <clears throat> it, it was just insane, to use a modern word, to what you could do in the Mirage 2000, because you could end up in this very, very close fight, Mirage versus Mirage, and because it was so manoeuvrable that you would end up in a, in a position where you could put your gun sight on a Mirage 2000 like that and you'd just be about to take a gunshot on some guy 
and he would just pull. And next thing you know, he'd be nose on to you and yeah. or, or be sort of nose on and pointing down like this. So whereas in a tornado, somebody once said to me that when you do air combat in, a, in an F3, it's, it's eventually you end up at base height at 5,000 feet. And it's like watching two dinosaurs plodding yeah. around this big circle. So you're, right. you're opposite sides of the circle. <clears throat> and once you become experienced as a fighter pilot, you you can predict 30 seconds, <coughs> sorry, 30 seconds ahead. So you can be two sides of the circle looking across at your Tornado F3 mm -hmm. and you go, right, he's, he's 180 out for me now. And I know in 30 seconds he's going to be here. So I want to be here. And it's like watching this chess in slow motion. Whereas when you do combat or DACT in a Mirage 2000, you don't have that luxury because the the 3D game of chess that you're playing is just changing so rapidly and so quickly. So you have to be very aware of it and you have to be aware of what your adversary is. So the F-16, for example, isn't quite as good, particularly on the earlier models at low speed. Yeah. Uh, so you, you might capitalize on that <clears throat> or you might use the fact that the Mirage 2000 has got this fantastic instantaneous turn capability and you might try and get a quick shot and then bug out and then fight another day. Um, but it's it's a very interesting aircraft to fly. And, of course, <clears throat> since Mirage 2000, nobody else has had a Delta. And the Rafale's a sort of Delta, but it's not really a Delta. Yeah. Um, and it, it doesn't, you know, the Mirage 2000 has got little tiny canards at the front, but it hasn't got movable canards. Yeah, yeah, of course, but yeah. It definitely was a game changer in terms of going from a Mirage 3 to Lightning Type F3. All of a sudden, people looked at the Mirage 2000 and went, oh, that's a pretty maneuverable aeroplane. So, Ian, did you ever fly the Mirage 2000 in a live theatre or combat? Uh, pretty much straight away. I flew um, in the Bosnia campaign uh, within about three months of arriving <clears throat> excuse me, on the squadron. And then I did uh, Iraq uh, from Saudi Arabia and back to Bosnia uh, once more, I think. So the, the Bosnia one was was actually pretty interesting because I literally, I don't know, maybe had 30, 40 hours on the aeroplane. And then the, at the time, the Mirage 2000s, the French Air Force, were based at uh, Cervia, which is on the um, eastern side of Italy, on the Adriatic. At the time, it was an ex um, G91 F104 base. And we were doing um, swing roll. So we had an air defense roll, and we also had and it had a ground roll. So the aircraft had um, two or maybe far, four Mark 82 500-pound bombs on the aircraft for oh, the air to okay. control. And we would, we would swap between doing um, some com combat air patrol, some CAS, some uh, other missions, uh, and it was very fluid in what we get tasked to do. And for an air defence pilot, very challenging as well. Absolutely, because uh, I think our viewers will be quite interested because I always thought their Mirage C was strictly air defence. I didn't know like you could kind of like switch to the air to ground rule. Well, it was. It was very simple. There was um, a switch uh, underneath the belly of the aircraft, and it was air ground, uh, air air, and that was it. And you just the ground crew oh, wow. under the panel, and they'd flick it from air to ground to air to air. If we were in the air-to-air -air role, you would fly with um, two magic missiles on the outside. Uh, or I don't think we flew with the, the Super 530s in um, sorry, uh, Super 530s in Bosnia because there was no real uh, air defence threat. So we only flew with like sidewinders, magic twos, mm -hmm. and the bombs. But they would, and it was very strange because when I applied to do the exchange tour. The Mirage 2000 was a clean wing, center line tank, and maybe four, two or four missiles. When I arrived, all of a sudden, and it was pretty much of a shock to me, and you know, I, I keep abreast of what goes on in aviation, it was pretty much of a shock to go, wow, those aircraft have got these huge big fuel tanks on, like the 2000D and the 2000N, and they've yeah. got bombs on, and they've got snare rockets on, and they've got other stuff on there. I'm thinking, oh, I, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> I, mean, depends, I didn't do this sort of stuff. So the first mission I did uh, in Bosnia, the squad had already been there before, and we did, I think we did maybe two months of rotations at a time, and it wasn't actually that far to get to from Orange to Italy, but you weren't allowed to go home ever, 
uh, you were on the base, and at the time during the conflict, there wasn't an awful lot going on, but we had these two 500 pound bombs under the aircraft just in case. But we did a thing called uh, CAS, Combat Air Support, and that involved you working with the SAS or the French Foreign Legion, and they would laser designate a target for you. Nice. And I remember, so I've never done CAS before, although I've, I've maybe done a little bit on the Jet Provost at Broadia. Maybe that's where they did um, close air support training in the Royal Air Force, and I think I just blagged a ride in the Jet Provost and got off and seen what they did. And so you you uh, you take off in your Mirage 2000. You you have a map and you have a you know have a whole stack of maps in your cockpit, and um, you also have some high resolution maps. And I did a a combat um, air support mission with I think it was the French Foreign Legion. I can't remember who it was, but one of the special forces. But the guy who I contacted. So you go to a secret frequency and you contact him. And he calls himself something like um, Rampard 26 or something, and you check in, you authenticate, and you get this rapport going. And then you you sit around about I don't know maybe five miles away from where the target is. So you're sitting in a, in a in this pattern flying around. You've got maps all over the cockpit, and then you're talking to a, a grunt on the ground. So this guy's saying to me, you know, you were Cotton 54, and I go, yeah, I'm Cotton 54. Uh, what's your position? I go, I'm five miles north of Istrana, and I'm at 4,000 feet, and I'm in a right-hand orbit. He goes, okay, I've got your visual. So he says, your target is, and this is a simulated one I was doing a training exercise on one of my very first close air support ones in the Mirage. He says, your target is um, a tank uh, next to a building, uh, next to a row of trees, blah, 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 blah. And this is what my target was going to be, a tank, and I was supposed to go and do a, a snub attack on it. So I'm flying around this circle, and his English isn't very good, not that my Malaysian or whoever it was, my, that language is very good, but he was giving me all these things like, do you see um, um, a wood with a red top building in, in your one o'clock? And I'm going, no, I don't. And what they do is they, they, they try and identify something for you without giving any way secrets, I don't think, is that um, they, they try and um, have a system where, like you and I, Mike, I, we know what one unit is. So I look down from my Mirage 2000 cockpit and I look down on the ground and I see a square shaped wood, a water tower and a village. And in between the water tower and the square shaped wood would be one unit. And it could be 10 miles, it could be one mile, whatever, but that's one unit. So he would say to me, uh, do you see the square shaped wood? And I'd go, yep, I see said, right, go north for five units. And I'm going right, north, five units. I spent 45 minutes and I never saw the tank. And I was going round and round and saying, <laughs> where that tank was, who knows? Nice. But, you know, it was, and again, later on, uh, when I'd done a couple of hundred hours on the Mirage, I took a guy flying with me on my wing and he was an Abernay, one of those learner guys from the headquarters. And we went off and did low level, close air support. <clears throat> we were flying around somewhere near Bordeaux at 250 feet. And we were doing it with this guy and I was writing all the stuff down on my knee pad. And that was one of my, you know, when you sort of reach a point where you think I'm saturated now, what yeah. I can actually do. And we were talking to this guy. I was navigating. I was trying to find, you know, a bushy top tree on a hill, two large vehicles, an, an armored tank vehicle or something, and look after this guy. The weather was pretty bad. And I just thought, well, I take my hat off to Jaguar pilots because that is hard work. <laughs> Swanning around in an air defense airplane doing air combat is pretty easy, but um, doing yeah. close air support is hard. So, yeah, we did we did close air support uh, or – so we, we could be tasked to do a CAS mission uh, where we might do some sort of cap near um, Sarajevo or some, some point on the ground. Or then the next day we could be fragged for um, just combat air patrol to protect – I don't know, maybe some F-18 is going to do something in Bosnia. So it, it would change day by day what we did. Um, but I guess they're all live missions and people do get shot down. So it was, it was reasonable. And uh, obviously, like I'll put the pictures up here, but there's some great photos from you, Ian. But uh, you, I, I think there's a couple where you're, in, you're tanking with, you know, there's F-14s and also Prowlers. How did that come about? Were you just like uh, vectored onto that thing? Or was that like a photo opportunity for yourself? No, I know. I mean, I, I would say that in all my books, <clears throat> you know, one of the things which I like to convey is that there's probably only 5% of the photographs in my books that are what I'd call, you know, canned 
let's do this sortie as an air-to-air -air photo sortie, right. maybe five percent. And I, I suppose on a, on a downside, then a lot of my pictures probably are taken on a tanker or going to the tanker, coming back from a tanker. And I, I always try to make sure that photographically that the the focus or the aim of the mission wasn't to go and get Ian Black's pictures. The aim yeah. of the mission is to go and do, you know, drop a bomb at a range or go and do air combat. And if on the way there we had five minutes to do a quick photo shoot or on the way back, I mean, the only thing that I did sort of twist people's arms was I always try to take the photographs going out to the mission because I knew on the way back we'd get split up and there'd be no fuel and it would all be too difficult. So I always try to do it on the way out to the target for whatever we're going to do. So in the books that I've done, uh, there was pictures of the uh, was it EA6B Prowlers. Yeah, the Prowlers, yeah. And they've got live harms on. And then again, that was, um, you know, I was flying with a guy, a really nice guy, Gratter, um, in a Mirage 2000. He was my wingman, or I was his wingman. <clears throat> and we arrived. And quite often you'd get the frag. And I, I confess, I can't remember what frag stands for now. It's some fragmented operational order or something. So you'd look down the frag and you would have your vol time, your vulnerability time, and you would be on cap, say, between 1400 and 1450, and then you would go to the tanker at 1450 to 1510. Right. So you could look and see that ahead of 1450 on the tanker would be EA-6Bs or F-18s or F-16s or whatever. Now, if you've got a probe on your Mirage 2000, you're not going to go to an American tanker, which has got a, yeah, a course, boot yeah. Boom. So you, you know that whatever tanker you get vectored to, and I probably I presume it didn't happen to me, but I presume you're always going to get vectored to one that has got a, a basket, will have other aircraft receivers on there that have also got a probe. And <clears throat> the the one of the you know my famous sort of or best photographs was arriving at the tanker and finding it was a Spanish C-130, and then there were two I think there were U.S. Marines, not the U.S. Navy. EA-6 Prowlers with harm missiles on, plus my wingman was in the squadron, you know, 25 jet, and it just, you know, the weather was lovely, and there was a full moon, and the AWACS actually going to the top, and I just sort of sat there and watched these two Prowlers tank, and then we tanked, and I got the, the nice sort of composed shot, and, I, and it was funny because in that time in Bosnia, whether it was one or two times that I've been there, but, you know, I, I can remember... Uh, and that's part of the reason why I take photographs is because now I have this sort of photographic memory, but it's not really a photograph memory. It's just a memory full of photographs and images that I have. So, you know, by looking at that photograph, I can click back to being over the Adriatic and going into Bosnia. If I didn't have that photograph, I probably wouldn't have that memory. And that's why part of the reason I took the photographs. But mm. in that period of two months, you know, I saw Marine EA-6Bs, I saw F-14s off the carrier, I saw F-18s, I saw Italian tornadoes on the tanker. So, you know, and we went to the RAF tanker, to the TriStar, we went to um, French tankers, American tankers, Spanish tankers. Uh, we had our own tanker on the Mirage 2000, which was good. Um, so you know, there was a whole variety of things which for a photographer and a pilot were very photogenic and it was a good time to be there, even though when you were in theatre, as it were, and over... Bosnia, you know, you couldn't really take many many photographs there. I did take a couple, but absolutely. Was there much banter between you and the French, and uh, obviously being a Brit when you were on the squadron with the Mirage? Um, no, I think they accepted me, and I had a, a fairly uh, similar sense of humour. You know, I had a passion for aeroplanes and jets and fine wine and women, blondes. So you know, <laughs> can't go wrong, I had can you? With them. Uh, and they were all really, really nice guys. Um, <clears throat> the language problem was, is, was difficult, and I made an effort that I would never speak English, and I, I hated speaking English, even though I couldn't speak French very well. <clears throat> and I had a huge respect for them because they were very good pilots. They were very... I think the French Air Force went from the Tongi and Lavadure uh, TV programs of them flying Mirage F1s and Mirage 3s, yeah. of being... You know, they always wore a white cravat, and they always drove a fancy car and had a, a blonde on their arm. And when the Mirage 2000 came, all of a sudden, they were fourth generation NATO jet fighters, and they were very good, really competent. And they took part in NATO, and they took it all very, very seriously. There was no sort of flamboyancy of being a French fighter pilot. Well, it was a bit, but, you know, it was a very serious job. And they debriefed incredibly professionally. Um, and they they were very, very keen to learn what my tactics experience was from flying the F3, particularly in things like um, 
missions I'd flown in the UK because I'd, I'd come from the Tornado F3 where I led missions with 20 aircraft on cap, leading 20 fighters against 60 targets, which they'd never done, yeah, or yeah. particularly things which they hadn't done, protecting AWACS, which is called HVAA, High Value Asset um, Protection. So, you know, they, they picked my brains on that and they definitely used my my knowledge and experience. And I did the same with them, you know, in terms of combat. But the, in terms of banter, yeah, there's like, you know, they're, they're fighter pilots. It doesn't matter whether you're Colombian, Peruvian, USAF, US Navy, you know, you're always going to banter with people and, okay. you know, you can take the mickey out of them and it's not personal, it's just banter. And it's that's what being a fighter pilot is. And you don't, you don't become woke and modern and go and cry in the corner you just oh, you God, give as good yeah. as you get and if you don't give as good as you get you lose you know it's simple you know you can if someone takes the mickey out of you you take the mickey back out of them and, until you win and then that's, that's it but that's um, I, was, I was pretty careful that i didn't i didn't uh, abuse my hospitality as it were in terms of taking photographs so i didn't you know i didn't push the taking images whereas i could in the air force a little bit because i was known in the air force as a photographer and a pilot and the RAF used my images for publicity and PR, whereas the French Air Force didn't particularly. And they didn't really have that um, uh, acceptance of pilots taking photographs. And, you know, I, I sort of got away with it in the RAF because QRA requires you to have a camera and take a picture of a Russian bed. Yeah. And I went around that by just saying, well, that's, you know, I'm just practicing for my job. Yeah. Whereas the French Air Force, that, that's not really part of doing QRA. Um, but... Yeah. Um, and I did it as really, you know, as a as a historical record of, of what I've done and what they've done. And, and 20 years later, you know, it, it's proven it's, it's worth because, you know, you put pictures on Instagram or Twitter or whatever and people go, wow, you know. And all the pilots, bar none pretty much, all say, I wish I'd taken more pictures. I wish I'd had my camera. I wish I'd done that. I've known uh, friends of mine who are GR4 pilots in Iraq and in Afghanistan <clears throat> and they, you know, they had an iPhone, but they didn't take pictures. And it was frowned upon. And, you know, looking yeah, at your yeah. pictures, you know, the Buccaneer on the back of your wall uh, on that print, there's, you know, I don't know any Buccaneer pilots that took pictures. And I know very few Buccaneer navigators that took pictures. And yeah. when you're a backseater, particularly in the back of a Buccaneer, you know, you've got an armchair view to, you know, you're sitting in the best cockpit in the world in the back of a Buccaneer with a wide angle lens. Absolutely. Stuff you see. But I don't know many guys that took photographs. And maybe, I don't know, people maybe just sort of have this conception that, you know, their job was to sit in the back of a buccaneer and be a navigator. And to take a photograph was, you know, not part of their job. Whereas to me, I used to get my bone dome and in my bone dome was my Nikon inside it and in a bag of that and a couple of rolls of film. And that, that was part of my flying equipment. So it, it came with me everywhere. And I, I don't think in 3,000 hours of flying fast jets or whatever I did, there was only one or two occasions where I thought, damn, I mean, I've left my camera behind. And I think once was when I intercepted an Indian Air Force Sea Harrier uh, somewhere in the Lake District on a test flight. But other than that, I always had my camera with me. Yeah, so how long did you spend on the 2000 and how many hours did you get? I, I think I was <clears throat> originally sent there for three years, although saying sent there wasn't, doesn't sound quite right, but... I did a three-year tour, and then there was probably six months at the beginning and a couple of months at the end when I extended. So that, that can coincide with me leaving the Air Force. So probably nearly four years I lived in France. Wow. And did you enjoy the experience? Every minute of it, yeah. It was, um, it was a privilege, and it was, it's very hard to convey just what a privilege it is because, you know, when you fly in the Royal Air Force, you sign out an aircraft – and you, you take a, I don't know, a Typhoon or a, an F-35 or whatever, and you're signing for it, and you're responsible for that aircraft, and when you come back, you sign it back in. But it's, you know, one of Her Majesty's aeroplanes. Yeah. When you go to France or America, you're signing for some other country's multi-million pound jet fighter. And the honor, and I, you know, I use that word honestly, you know, it is a huge honor that somebody says to me, it's like me saying to you, if I owned a Lamborghini, you know, here you go, Mike, here's my keys. Just go and do what you like with it. And, exactly, yeah. You know, see how fast it will go and do what you like. For somebody to say to you, they trust you enough, you know, the French Air Force to say, here's Mirage number, you know, 59, and you sign for it and off you go, and you do a war mission with it, or you go and do air combat or DACT. 
it is, there's no other word but an honor to actually, and a privilege to, to fly somebody else's aircraft. Because, you know, when they're RAF, they're HM governments, they, they feel like they're yours and they're part of the, they're British. But to fly French Air Force aircraft. Absolutely, yeah. yeah that must be like, yeah, yeah. Another like country's Air Force, like yeah. multi million dollar jet. Yeah. Not jealous at all, Ian, but uh, nope. yeah. <laughs> So this is from Alexander Vatter, and he states, in Ian's original view, Ian talks about the F uh, 2000C's ability to switch from air to air to air to ground. My understanding is that this was a rather limited mode that allowed the plane to deploy unguided bombs and rocket pods. So the question is, how deep were the uh, changes in regards to the avionics uh, in brackets here, if you know this, what what this means, uh, CCIP, CCRP, and so on. And for him, as a more or less pure air defence, did he get some refreshing training by the French, or just relied on his Hawk training back in Chivinet or Brody? Well, Alexander, that's a very good question, and uh, I can only answer it from <clears throat> the time I spent there and. In the time I spent there, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm having to do this from memory, as I said to Mike earlier, there was a switch underneath the aircraft, which was air ground, air to air, and that was the ground crew did that. That was simple. On the weapon display panel, you had all the weapon symbology on there, and in the head-up display, you had all the weapon aiming. I'm not saying it's easy because I didn't, I, I'm sorry, I didn't enjoy air to ground. I didn't get the same buzz I did from air to air. Uh, and there was no training, really. You know, you went to the simulator, I think. You went to the sim and you dropped a couple of bombs. And it was all to do with the weapon selection. And the head-up display knew what uh, weapon you'd selected down the weapon display panel. So that would give you the correct symbology. In terms of the CCIP, which I think is the – I think Alexander means the um, – the sort of non-radar gun sight type stuff, that, again, was all fixed into the aircraft. Now, when I left the 2000C, it became the 2000 from the RDI to the RDY and the Dash 5. Whether they changed that uh, it, symbology from more to air to ground, I don't know. I don't think so. I think it probably went more back the other way to air to air uh, on the 2000 Dash 5. But I know they do still fly with um, 2000 Dash 5s with some air to ground weapons on it. In terms of what we did, I mean, we weren't doing, you know, we flew with um, the 2000D, which is, you know, super capable, and the 2000N. Now, 2000N's obviously got a specific role, a strike role to drop nuclear weapons, but and that's gone now. And they didn't, I don't know why, I did ask somebody why the French Air Force didn't retrofit the 2000N to become a D-type strike aircraft. I don't know why they didn't do that. It seemed like a missed opportunity there to me. But the 2000C, we, you know, we were very limited. Uh, you know, we didn't have a night capability of dropping laser-guided weapons, and we didn't have any high-precision guidance for weapons. So you, we were probably more, you know, when I said to earlier on, Mike, that we were swing roll, I'm trying to think of an analogy of what sort of aircraft we were. So we weren't a dedicated, you know, a bit like a jack-of-all-trades master of none. You know, we weren't mm -hmm. a GR. Or we were not a Harrier, and that wasn't our main role. But I guess we could be taken off cap and made to go and deliver a bomb or something. And you know, we flew with SNEB, which is 67 millimeter rockets, which are pretty lethal things. And we flew against um, tanks, and we would go and fire lives weapons against them when we were at Sonzara or um, from from Orange and air to ground with a gun. But uh, I only remember dropping little practice, like 28 pound, like the RAF do, um, practice bombs. I never dropped a 500 pound bomb for real on the Mirage 2000. And they had a thing called a tortue, a tortoise underneath, and they would put these little plastic bombs underneath, and off you'd go. And I think the scores were pretty good. You know, they were pretty similar. I guess it's a bit like a hawk, really, like a you know high a high tech hawk. It, that sort of aircraft, you know, go and drop a couple of bombs, maybe fire some snab. So you know, real world, you know, you might go off and <clears throat> do some damage against some tanks or some armored personnel carriers, but you know you're not going to be you're not going to be tasked with um, taking out you know some enemy HQ at two o'clock in the morning on night vision goggles in a package of 84 aircraft and your number 52 or yeah. dropping 
to blow up a, um, an airfield like a, a GR4 might have been. It was limited air to ground, I guess. Yeah, and hopefully that um, Ian answered your question there, Alexander. So thanks for that, Ian. But uh, I'm going to move on because uh, I want to talk about obviously your wonderful photography, Ian, and obviously your brilliant website, uh, FireStreetBooks.com. So tell us, like, yeah, just give us a like an overview of like how you got into it and what books you've actually got currently out available to the public. So uh, my <clears throat> my book publishing career, sounding like uh, somebody very famous, started <laughs> off last <It> great. <laughs> <laughs> um, doing colour series books. I did one on the tornado, did one on the lightning, and then I did one called Combat Edge, I think it was, with Osprey. And I stopped when I left the Air Force and became an airline pilot, but I had, you know, 200,000 slides lying around. And I'd always had a, a dream, I guess, to produce my own books. And I'd always wanted to do books that were, without, you know, trying to look like I'm advertising, but I wanted to do books that, and funny enough, I've just seen a very world-famous friend of mine who's the, the best photographer in the world. But I wanted to do books where the gutter, the middle of the page, doesn't cut the photograph in half. And I wanted the books to to be on somebody's coffee table that they can sit and enjoy. And I'm not being lazy, but I wanted the photographs to speak for themselves. I didn't want to have a whole lot of writing in there because I had other plans for that. So I looked at uh, other publishers, and <clears throat> aviation is always a bit of a niche market, as you know, Mike. It's... Um, I don't know if you if you um, did a survey on your website or through a career interview, you know, how many people in the UK are interested in aviation? And I guess through Instagram, or whatever, you could work out how many people are. There's probably thousands. And I, I once read that aviation and air shows is the second most popular thing to fish in, which is you know the big popular sport in the UK oh on football. But it's people love aviation from six year old boys and girls to 75-year-old men yeah. and it's a broad spectrum but the number of people who are interested in you know a mirage 2000 and stuff right. is yeah. it's niche isn't it and it's you know maybe four or five thousand people in the uk who've got that passion so i knew that i was never going to produce a harry potter bestseller but i could probably produce you know a couple of thousand copies per book and it's there is actually you know and and I always we've spoken before about it at length but there there is actually a bit of a science to it all and you know I I do um, when I do my fire street books I don't just throw together a hundred pictures I spend hours and hours as my wife would tell you of working out um, exactly how the format and the layout artistically will work so. You know, a picture on the left-hand side should flow out the left-hand side, and a picture yeah. on the right-hand side should flow out the right-hand side. And then you don't want to have two pictures of two Jaguars on each page. And if it is a picture of a Jaguar, you know, it's got to be blue on one side, and it's got to be a Lolo on the right-hand side, and then you've got to go to a tanker. And so when I get my 150 images to go in the book, I spend hours and hours and hours moving them around on iPhoto or Aperture or Photoshop yeah. of making sure, and I look at them all, of seeing how the whole thing flows. And I try and include something for everybody. So it's a bit of a potpourri type thing of, you know, there are pictures on the ground, maybe a close up of an F4 Phantom, so you can see all the boot marks and scuff marks. So people who make little plastic models, they can, you know, get super detailing and see how the weathering goes on it. Then there are pictures in there of um, just an F16 flying along. And then there might be a picture of an F16 on a tanker. and. I try and mix it all up so that there's something for everybody there, and then particularly the ground crew as well. So I, I try to make sure that it's not I love me book. You know, it's not all about a pilot flying an aeroplane. It's not this is a, a book about me. It's a book about. So you know, I'm, I'm not advertising again. But I, if I flick through this book on on combat ready, and I'm looking at a picture of um, a buccaneer. So that is a is a picture of a buccaneer, and. You know, there's, there's not many words to it, but it's a photograph of a buccaneer, and it's, it, it symbolizes to me that whether you flew, if you flew a buccaneer in the front or the back, or you were an engineer on the buccaneer, or your grand crew, or you're the singer, or you were based at Lossy Mouth when the buccaneer was there, that picture is basically for you. You know, it's a memory of you being at Lossy Mouth in whatever capacity you were, 
of flying the Buccaneer or, or maintaining it, or somebody who flew Phantoms and did intercepts against Buccaneers. So it's, it covers everybody. But uh, yeah, Ian, so let's talk about where we can find you online because obviously you've got your website, uh, Twitter and Instagram. Do you know them off heart or do you want me to put them in for yeah. you? Uh, no, I'm on, on Twitter. I'm on uh, as Blicky Ian. And, I, and I, I sort of quite like Twitter at the moment. I, I sort of flick between the two because I find Twitter's quite good because somebody asks me a question. You know, Have you got a picture of a jaguar? Yeah, I've got a picture of a jaguar. I'll put one up. And then I, you get a bit of instant feedback, don't you? And yeah. you get a banter. And as you said, you know, people, uh, and I'm not you know, trying to big yourself up, but people sort of look at you as a, a lightning phantom Mirage 2000 tornado pilot, and they go, oh, is it, you know, and they don't want to talk to you. But by Twitter, if somebody says to me, oh, what, what was the lightning like in combat? I can just have a quick 110 words. And that's, I guess, the problem with Twitter is that you can't give them Explain the full yourself too much. Yeah, yeah. You've just got a, yeah, it was good in combat. And then they go, wow, I spoke to you in black. And they where are you know, it, I'm not, I'm modest. You know, I, anybody can speak to me. Anybody can ask me a question. So I'm on Twitter and I use Twitter as much as I can. I've just started with Instagram with Fire Street Books. I think it's called Fire Street Books. Yeah, and, Fire Street uh, Books. Here you go, guys, if you see them. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. A young me. And uh, young you, yeah. I occasionally use Facebook, uh, but I've sort of gone away from that a bit, really, more to the sort of the marketing side of the Facebook, um, Instagram, and, and Twitter. Um, because I think you get a bit more of that instant reaction, and you know, I don't really want to see people's breakfast eggs, beans, and chips on Facebook, which people do, don't they? Yeah. At least with um, Instagram, the people who follow you are all into the same sort of thing. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and on Instagram, it's quite good as well because if you take a, you know, you look at that picture on that book or you look at the back cover, when I put that up there, I can put a little story and you can do stories. And I like, you know, music. And I like adding the music to the story when I've got the time yep. about how I took that picture. You know, what what camera lens I use and what was I thinking? What was the mission we were doing? And, yeah, know. a bit of backdrop as well. And also, yeah. Ian's like obviously our uh, Facebook um, private group. Uh, Ian's in there, so I'm sure you know once this interview goes up, I'm sure Ian will be happy to yeah. um, you know answer your questions because it is a private group. Uh, the people there are obviously interested in aviation, but. Uh, yeah, Ian, what a pleasure to talk to you again. It's been absolutely great. And yeah, hopefully next year um, I, I, we do a, a thing called Happy Hour. I don't know if you've seen that before. I think I saw Rick, Rick Pico Edwards work his way through a couple of bottles of gin or something. Yeah. yeah, so maybe next year we can uh, do a Happy Hour if it's obviously safe and happy. I think uh, our viewers would love that. So yeah. maybe we can get uh, together uh, and have a few beers together. I think, as we said, you know, I'm uh, I'm hoping to move to the south of France, and I know that in the town where I am, there's a Mirage 2000. So maybe, you know, with the, the technologies of 4G and Skype, we can I can sit by a Mirage 2000, or even go back on the base and and do something there, and and, and actually have some live aircraft and things. But because I, I know there's there's so many people interested in the Mirage 2000, and also now it seems to be the flavour of month, the Cold War, doesn't it? And oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, by the Cold War. Yeah. Well, brilliant. Well, thanks very much for coming on the show, Ian. It's absolute been an absolute pleasure. pleasure. You too. Cheers, Mike. Cheers.